Chapter 8 Hudabia and Kheber. A number of pagan tribes that were settled in the region around Medina participated in the Allied onslaught on the city. Muhammad spent most of the year following the Battle of the Trench dealing with them. A small expedition was sent down to the town of Dukarad. Its inhabitants were engaged in raiding and kidnapping Muslims from Medina. Another small force of around 200 men was sent to Fidak, where a new plan was being hatched to invade Medina. But Muhammad, Muhammad's mind was elsewhere. In February of 628 of the Common Era, he gave advance warning that he intends to go to Mecca as a pilgrim. He donned the simple dress of a pilgrim and set off for the city, the city where he was born, to visit the Gaba. He was accompanied by 1,400 of his followers, all dressed in ritualistic pilgrim garb, two unsewn pieces of white cloth, one serving as a loincloth and the other wrapped toga-like, covering one's shoulder, and carrying no weapons. They were all going to perform the Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage. Naturally, the Quraysh were none too pleased to hear of Muhammad's intended visit to Mecca. They suspected his motives. Is a new tactic, a war game designed to enter and subdue Mecca. They thought it was a manoeuvre designed to show the world that, while the Quraysh could not gain entry to Medina, Muhammad could enter Mecca. They swore to prevent Muhammad on any account. A party of 200 raid riders were dispatched to intercept Muhammad and convey and prevent him from reaching the city. Muhammad's pilgrim's caravan was forced to stop at Hudabiya, about 12 kilometers from Mecca. The Quraysh sent men to the Muslim camp both on fact-finding missions and to warn Muhammad. One of them was Urwa bin Masood, a well-traveled old man considered to be wise. He came and sat before Muhammad. His language was not particularly diplomatic and every time he spoke his hand almost touched Muhammad's beard. The Prophet's companions were concerned and there were sharp exchanges. Mus Muhammad assured Urwa that he had not come to fire but only to perform the Umrah. When Urwa returned to Mecca, he informed the Quraysh how Muhammad's companions treated him. I've seen Karo in the kingdom of Caesar, in his kingdom and the Nigus in his kingdom, but never have I seen a king among his people like Muhammad like he is with his companions. For a time it looked as if a stalemate had been reached. Muhammad had sent messengers of his own to the leaders of the Quraysh. They were treated harshly. A small party of Quraysh ra raided the Muslim camp at night, pelting them with stones. The Meccans tried to provoke Muhammad to a fight, knowing that without any weapons the Muslims were in no position to defend themselves. Then they sent a special envoy to negotiate. There's a subsection here. Insulting Muhammad. Muhammad was frequently mocked and abused. This is mentioned in the Quran. Whenever they see you, O Prophet, they ridicule you. Kind of like today, isn't it? Um, chapter 24, verse 41. And the disbelievers think it's strange that a prophet of their own people had come to warn them. They say... He's just a lying sorcerer. Chapter 38, verse 4. These attacks must have upset him, but the Quran advises him to have patience with what they say and leave them with a noble dignity. Chapter 73, verse 10. He is repeatedly asked to forgive and overlook. Chapter 5, verse 13. And to treat those who abuse him with kindness. Thus, despite contemporary claims, there is no law against blaspheming Muhammad. His name was Suhail ibn Amr, one of the Meccans' most articulate and influential men. He came with a proposal. This time Muhammad was to return to Medina without entering Mecca, and the following year he would be allowed to enter Mecca for three days to perform the pilgrimage. By this arrangement, they argued that Arabian tribes would not be able to claim that Muhammad entered Mecca 
in defiance of the Quraysh. After some discussions and the usual consultation, Muhammad accepted the proposal. The negotiation, however, was still not concluded. The agreement had to be committed to writing. And it was part of the Quranic revelation that, transpar that transparent and open dealing between parties to an engagement should be recorded in writing. What followed demonstrates how accommodating and flexible Muhammad was prepared to be and how determined he was to make peace. Muhammad dictated the words in the name of God, the beneficent, but so he objected. He knew nothing of a beneficent God. He insisted on using the customary formula in your name, O Allah. The Muslims murmured, but Muhammad accepted. He went on to dictate. This in the treaty of peace between the Prophet of God and Zuhail objected again. To acknowledge that Muhammad was a prophet of God would be tantamount to becoming a follower. This designation should simply be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. This time the Muslims were really agitated. They refused to change the sentence. Some of them held the hand of the scribe and declared that Muhammad, the prophet of God, it must be written, or the master matter settled, or the matter will be settled in battle. Muhammad himself called for the words, the prophet of God, to be pointed out to him. He crossed them out and instructed his cousin Ali to write Muhammad ibn uh, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. The writing of the treaty proceeded without further interruptions. It specified that peace was to last for 10 years and that any person from the Quraysh migrating to Muhammad's camp in Medina, they would be returned to Mecca. But any Muslims emigrating from Medina to Mecca would not be allowed to return. It also stipulated that local tribes were free to ally themselves to either with the Quraysh or Muhammad without hindrance from either side. As soon as the Treaty of Hudabiyah was concluded, various tribes started to declare which side they would support. The clan of Banu Bakr, Muhammad's old and inve inveterate enemies, joined the Quraysh. The Khuzza joined Muhammad. Suhail's son, Abu Jandal, announced that he was going to join the Muslim camp. Suhail was incensed to see his own son change loyalties in his front of him. He punched his son in the face and pulled him by his hair, pulled him back to the Quraysh camp. Abu Jandal called out, to the Muslims to save him from being returned to Mecca and persecuted for his faith. The Muslims felt compelled to act but Muhammad told Abu Jandal, be patient and be disciplined for God will provide a way out for you and your persecuted friends from your suffering. We have entered with the Quraysh into a treaty of peace and we have exchanged with them solemn pledge that none will cheat the other. Abu Jandal was taken aback was taken back in custody to Mecca. The Muslims were disheartened. They returned to Medina thinking they had been humiliated. But on the surface, the Treaty of Hudabiyah appeared rather one-sided. But even before Muhammad, uh, Muslims reached Medina, a revelation declared the Hudabiyah agreement to be a victory. Truly, we, that's God, have opened up a path to clear triumph for you so that God may forgive you your past and future sins, complete his grace upon you and guide you to the straight path and help you mightily. Chapter 48, verses 1 up to verses 3 of the Quran. The verses were a reminder that a truce, even if it appeared one-sided, and even if it brings only partial peace, is to be preferred. Indeed, the treaty did bring peace to Medina and provided Muhammad with much needed breathing space. Hostilities between Mecca and Medina was replaced with security and mutual trust. Conversions to Islam increased manifold. The Khaybar Expedition The Hudabiyah Agreement considerably, uh, considerably reduced the Jewish influence on Arabia. The Jewish clans based in Khaybar were among the richest and the strongest people in the peninsula. Their force was exceptionally well protected and equipped for all eventualities. 
With the Quraysh out of the picture, their power was somewhat diminished. They suspected that Muhammad would move against them. Some of the leaders were of the opinion that alliances should be made with other Jewish tribes in Arabia and that a, prevent, a preemptive strike made against Medina. Other leaders wished to enter into the Hudabiyah type treaty while the Jewish clans were still debating their next move. Muhammad decided to march against Khaybar. He led an army of 1600 battle-hardened soldiers with a cavalry of 100 and they moved swiftly and clandestinely to reach Khaybar within three days. The Jewish tribes were taken by surprise. They only learned of Muhammad's army when they, he was standing in front of the city. It was the morning of the 15th of March, 628 of the Common Era. Subsection Muhammad's orders to his army. Do not kill the women, do not kill the children and the non-combatants, and do not cut down the trees or destroy the buildings. The Quraysh and other tribes of Arabia, including the neutral Jewish tribe of Ghatafan, watched the campaign from the sideline and awaited the outcome. The Jewish tribe of Heber realised that this was their last stand against Muhammad. The city had six different forts, several fortified quarters. The Jewish clans stored their treasures in one fort and their families in another, while the warriors took shelter in a third, called Natat. It was a good strategy. Muhammad's army could, lay, could not lay siege to all the forts at once, nor could he maintain his position for long. He didn't have the provisions for a prolonged war, and there was every chance he might be cut from, off from Medina. Muhammad attacked Natat, and a fierce battle took place. The Jews fought bravely, 50 Muslims were wounded, and Muhammad had to retreat. The siege, however, continued. Further attempts were made to capture Natat, and finally Ali, the cousin of the Prophet, managed to break in. The defenders immediately moved to the next fort, Gamus. This was also taken, and they moved to the next, Al Saab. And by now the provisions of Muhammad's army had run out and they had to he eat their horses to survive. There was strenuous fighting to capture Al Saab with the Jews fighting heroically in his defence. But it too was captured. Al Saab had plenty of food and water so Muhammad's army finally had all the provisions it needed. Having relieved their hunger, the Muslims turned their attention to the next fort and the Jews had now gathered into the fortress of Al-Zubair, and it was surrounded and attacked a number of times. Courageously defended, the Muslims could not take the fort until they discovered and seized its water supply. The Jews were forced to come out and engage the Muslims in open battle, and they lost. The remaining fort fell quickly till only the fortresses of Wate and Sulaim fell quickly till only the fortress oh sorry hang on till were left sorry let me start again the remaining forts fell quickly till only the fortress of Wate and Sulaim were left and this is where the defenders family were hiding and the treasures were stored the Jews now became desperate and offered to surrender on specific terms. Their lives should be spared, the women's and children should not be touched and in return they would pay half the produce of their land in homage to Medina. The terms were accepted. The news of the fall of Khaybar spread quickly. Other Jewish clans including those based in Fadak, Wadi al qura and Taima also accepted the authority of Muhammad. Letters and Emissaries The relationship between the Jews and the Muslims did not immediately become peaceful. Their defeat at Khaybar stirred resentment on the Jewish side. There was even an attempt to poison Muhammad. Eventually the region of north of Medina was rendered as calm as the south had been. 
thanks to the Hudabiya agreement. It was during this period that Muhammad sent letters to the ruler and kings of adjoining countries, inviting them to join the faith of Islam. He sent letters to Heraclius of Byzantine, who ruled the empire from the city of what's it called Antoich, Karoz II of the Persian Empire, who ruled of the rule of Alexandria, the Lord of Syria, and the Negus of Abyssinia, Ethiopia. The letters were similar. Each short, direct and worded appropriately for each recipient. Heraclius, for example, Muhammad wrote, In the name of God, the merciful and compassionate, from Muhammad, the messenger of God, to Heraclius, the rule of Rome, peace to whoever follows the right guidance, to proceed, submit yourself and you shall be safe. Submit yourself, and God shall give you reward twice over. But if you turn your back, the sins of the husbandman shall be upon you. The sins of the husbandman may be referenced to the parable of the wicked husbandman in Matthew 22, verses 33 up to verses 46. To Negus, Muhammad wrote, In the name of God, the merciful and compassionate, from Muhammad, the messenger of God, to the Negus of Asham, king of Ethiopians. May you be at peace, I pray to you, God, the king, the most holy, the peace, the keeper of faith, the watcher, and a bear witness that Jesus, the son of Mary, is a spirit and the word of God, which he casts into goodly and chaste Virgin Mary, so that she conceived Jesus to whom God creates from his spirit and breathed into him even as he created Adam by his hands and breathed into him. I call you to God alone, who has no partner, who continued obedience to him, and that you follow me and believe in what has come to me, for I am the messenger of God. The following year, as stipulated in the Hudabiya agreement, Muhammad went to Mecca for Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage. He was accompanied by 2,000 companions, Many of them were muhajirs, migrants, who had not seen their birthplace or their families that they had left behind seven years ago. And the Quraysh kept their side of the bargain and left the city with their families. After three days, the Muslims were asked to leave the city. They obliged. But by now, a number of notable Meccans, including Khalid ibn Walid, the Quraysh's hero at the Battle of Uhud, had converted to Islam and accompanied Muhammad to Medina. In the coming months, Muhammad sent a number of missionaries throughout Arabia, inviting various tribes and clans to Islam. Many of these ambassadors were killed. He also sent an expedition to Syria. Historians def differ about the reasons for this campaign. Some suggest it was initiated as the murder of his emissary, to the Byzantine governor of Basra. Others give the murder of one of his companions as the cause. Whatever the reasons, Heraclius was well prepared. Some accounts suggest that he led his army himself. Others that his brother, Theodorus, was its commander. Muhammad's army of 3,000 met an army estimated between 100,000 and 200,000 Greek and Arab soldiers at the Battle of Muta. As one Muslim commander after another fell during the battle, the Muslim ranks became disorganised. Command finally fell on the shoulders of Khalid ibn Walid. Using his experience in the Battle of Uhud, he employed a similar tactic of, to fox the enemy. A contingent was deployed towards the rear of the army to give the impression that massive reinforcements had arrived from Medina to join the battle. The strategy worked and the Syrian army, already convinced of the determinations with which the Muslims fought, decided to abandon the battle and withdrew. The Muslims returned to Medina neither victorious nor de defeated. The Quraysh viewed the outcome of the Battle of Muta quite differently. 
They were of the opinion that Muslim power and dignity were now compromised. Muhammad could still be defeated. In the clear violations of the Hudabiyah agreement, Banu Bakr, encouraged by the Quraysh, attacked the Khuzza, a tribe allied with the Muslims, to settle all scores. While the members of the Khuzza were sleeping in a place near Mecca, Banu Bakr fell on them, killing some and looting their property. The Khuzza took shelter in Mecca but received no protections from the Quraysh. They ran to Medina and reported what had happened to Muhammad. The Prophet asked the Quraysh to pay compensation to the Khuzza and desist from helping and supporting Banu Bakr or to declare the Hudabiyah agreement null and void. The Quraysh chose a second option. Muhammad asked his followers to mobilize themselves in defense of the Khuzza. His objective, however, was larger than defending the terms of the Treaty of Hudabiyah.